All right, here's the third lesson of our chapter on the colonies, the middle colonies, also known as the Atlantic colonies, Pennsylvania, New York, Delaware, and New Jersey. Left side chart, snap chart for you is looking just like this. It's a pretty simple thing. You can refer and review your bagpipe terms and themes and what that involves economically, politically, socially for people. Uh, who's settling there is what we're really talking about there for the, these colonies. And... Uh, Put that into your left side. There's a second essential question here on the Quakers and the Puritans. We want to be able to compare and contrast them, identify some similarities. There's a STEM statement for you at the bottom where you could make a thesis or a mini claim statement on uh, what their differences were, but yet what were their similarities. So some left side preparation for you and a little bit of structure to get you going. Struggle for power in England is always an issue, has been for a long time. Religion was definitely d tied into that. The Puritans had controlled Parliament for quite a while. Remember, we talked about Oliver Cromwell overthrowing the monarchy, uh, a Puritan in his group and his mindsets, establishing a Puritan type of government, basically, uh, against King Charles I. Uh, there's a civil war that begins. Uh, kind of slows down pretty significantly the great migration of New Englanders to uh, Boston and Plymouth colonies, well, Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth colonies. Some of them actually go back to fight, and uh, they do help him become leader for a while. Oliver Cromwell, for about seven or eight years, uh, is in charge. He gets his head chopped off because he's kind of intense, crazy, and violent and brutal. And uh, the monarchy eventually gets restored a number of years later. So again, this whole event in Europe really slows things down in terms of settlement into the colonies. But once we get the reestablishment of the monarchy, Charles II becoming king in 1660, his reign is going to be known as the Restoration, meaning the monarchy and the crown is restored to power. And at this point, after about almost 20, you know, 20 years plus worth of not much colonization going on, England can resume colonization of the New World. And this is where we get at the influx and establishment of our Middle or Atlantic colonies, the Restoration colonies. And they are located in a significant spot. We know that we've got Jamestown down here in the south, one cluster of colonies, and the New England Puritan Pilgrim Colonies, Plymouth Bay, Plymouth Colony, Massachusetts Bay Colony up here as well. However, there is in the middle this other colony, controlled by the Netherlands, Holland, the Dutch, and uh, it is known as New Netherlands. And its principal port city is New Amsterdam. Amsterdam is in Holland today. And so... We've got these two English colonies established, and in between are the Dutch, who are a problem. And you can imagine, as the English want to have more land and expand more into the west and in the interior of the continent, and the people in Jamestown are also doing the same thing, there's a little bit of a problem here, and there are those people of Dutch background, the Dutch, in the way, and their major competitors in Europe and the world scene and world trade, so on and so forth. So this is going to ultimately result in some conflict. And so New Netherlands is the name of this Dutch colony. Uh, the Dutch are especially into just trading goods. They were major uh, shippers. They had a major fleet of ships that sailed around the world. Uh, they had a company called the Dutch East India Company. They sailed all the way over to India and back into the New World. They're really trying to establish a center of trade and trade exchange of goods with the New World, North America, and Europe. And this particular settlement of New Amsterdam is going to be, oops, going in the wrong direction here, is really going to be the center of trade and one of the most important centers of trade in the New World, established by the Dutch. Dutch. And so this Dutch, Dutch East India Company also then has kind of a sister company that's established when they come settle in the New and in, in into the North and North American colonies. That is the Dutch West India Company. They encourage settlements and encourage settlers to their colony by offering land to those who would pay for others to come there and establish the land. And they settle a lot of 
territory and land right up the Hudson River. And this system is called the Patroon system, very much like the headright system used down here in Jamestown. This is a way in which they encouraged people to come and settle the land. And these Patroon ships were given to individual wealthy people who had money to pay for other people to come over, just like the headright system did. And they basically controlled that labor force and controlled that land. And they kind of ruled like kings. They had their own courts, their own laws. They basically set up their own little kingdom and world in the New World in this colony of New Amsterdam. And they also, not only, as I mentioned before, owned the, the labor, they owned basically a share of the crops and got a share of the crops in this process as well. So, as we said before, this is very much most similar to the headright system in Jamestown. There's a lot of work needed to be done in the New World, and there's a big shortage of labor. And so indentured servants down here in the Chesapeake Bay colonies is the way in which the work was done, or they got workers to do the work and attracted them to the New World, and the patroon ships was how things were done in New Amsterdam. There it is, the correct answer. So England takes over, though, New Amsterdam. There's competition here, right? This is one of our major themes in Chapter 2. What's the response, result of, of the Age of Exploration? How did it impact you know, European countries? There's a lot of competition for space and trade, and there's wars that pop up because of this. And England's a little bit jealous. And the harbor that's there is a very natural harbor. It had access to the interior of the continent through the Hudson River Bay, or Hudson River. And basically, England sends a fleet to attack it. The governor, the Dutch governor of New Amsterdam, Peter Stuyvesant, wasn't really prepared for anything like this. And the colony basically surrendered without a shot. And King Charles then gives this colony to his brother, the Duke of York, who named it, you guessed it, New York. And there they are, all those fancy people. Look at that dress. Good style. New York is a proprietary colony. One of the key terms that we need to know, we'll come back to this again a little bit later on. This is one of the political things we could categorize for ourselves in our left side snap chart. Proprietary colony refers to a proprietor. If you imagine somebody who is a store owner or owns their own business or store, you are the proprietor of your own little store. Uh, they were the proprietor of a huge colony and a huge area of land. They controlled the land. They established the government. They decided to determine what was going on there in terms of life in that particular colony. And compared to the New England colonies, uh, you know, the New England colonies really voted and elected their governor and their assembly. But here, the proprietor is in charge of directing everything that happens with the government and the colony and the political system there. But by 1691, we start to see a trend happening in that there's more independence given, and the English government allows citizens of New York itself to elect their legislators. And proprietors eventually kind of go away. So we have a little bit of a sense of democracy in a way for those religious believers and those who are members of the church in New England, having a vote and saying things and not directly controlled by the king and parliament back in England. And eventually that does happen here in New York also. The population of New York uh, is very diverse. And this is one of the major themes for the Middle Colonies compared to New England and compared to the Chesapeake Bay Colonies. There is a smattering of all kinds of people. Just from the very beginning, the Dutch it establishing a port here uh, of New Amsterdam, which is going to be present-day New York, has a lot of trade and activity from all around the world in Europe. And so a lot of people settle there. And what is going to transpire here in the future is that they're going to encourage the settlement of people from around the world to settle there as well, especially in one of our upcoming colonies, Pennsylvania. So they have a really diverse population. The Dutch, the Germans, there's Swedish people there. Uh, the Swedes actually had a colony down here in Delaware and uh, Native Americans as well. Uh, there were Brazil some Brazilian Jews. Uh, some of the first Jews to settle in North America actually were in New York. Um, by the time we get to 1664, there were 8,000 people in New York, which was pretty darn big for the for North America. 
There were, however, some slaves in these middle colonies. Slavery is just not at this point in time in the colonial period a characteristic of the South and Jamestown down here, uh, but it is something that is allowed for in the other colonies. But we'll just talk about the factors that allow it to be more dominant and predominant in the South versus the North in the future as we go on. So there's significant variety in terms of people and the peopling of the middle colonies, especially New York, and the growth is fairly big as well because of that port connection of New York and to the New World and to or to the Old World, to Europe, so on and so forth. But it's a big area, this, this land that's given to the Duke of York. And so the Duke of York eventually gives some of this to a guy by the name of Lord John Berkeley and Sir John Carteret. They name it New Jersey after an island of Jersey in after the island of Jersey in the English Channel, which is where Carteret was born. And to attract settlers, they offered significantly large areas of land and freedom of religion, right? Freedom of religion kind of being a theme as to why the Puritans came, not so much down in Jamestown, but there is still this religious conflict that's going on in England with the monarchy being restored, Puritans and other people like Quakers that we'll talk about a little bit. And so there's a great deal of open opportunity economically here and also religiously in the middle colonies as well. Trial by jury was offered, a representative assembly where people get to vote, a direct say into what happens there, and of course the type of people that are voting there is all of those who are men and own property. They were the ones that were establishing local laws and tax rates. Independence grew and reigned in the colonies. The population of New Jersey, also religiously diverse because of this. It had really no natural harbors or a major port city like New York, and so New York, again, is very dominant because of that and grew more and more because of that and other places relying on things coming into New York and into the other colonies. Eventually, the proprietors here kind of go away again, and they sell their shares in the colony and their land and their property to other people. And eventually, in this case, it becomes a royal colony, which means the king became more directly controlled, controlling of the colony. Yet the king, ruling from so far away, can't really control things very directly or be too controlling because that actually takes people to do that. And that's expensive. You have to pay those people to make sure that things are controlled exactly the way you want it. So therefore, they still have a lot of autonomy and independence. Our next colony is Pennsylvania, known as Pencil Penn's Woods. And King Charles gives this area to William Penn to pay off a debt that was owed by him to William Penn's father. And William Penn was a Quaker, and the Quakers had ideals that were very different and conflicting to the Anglican Church and the English Church. And they were oppressed and persecuted as well for these ideals. And as a way of promoting the growth of English colonies, he is given a charter to this particular massive area. The debt is also paid off to the Penn family. And William Penn sees this as an opportunity to place his Quaker ideals into practice and try to set them up in this colony in kind of a whole. So the Quakers, also known as the Society of Friends, believed that everyone was equal. Everybody had an inner light to salvation and that everybody had a personal kind of a connection with God. There is no clergy or top you know, religious leader within the group. They were pacifists, very important to understand. Uh, and they refused uh, to use force for resolving any issue and to fight in wars. So if you can imagine, the Quakers are a problem for kings just in the fact that when a king wants to wage war and raise an army, the pacifists would resist that and not want to support it. And perhaps other people would say, hey, I want to be a Quaker too because I don't want to go to war. So therefore, you can't wage successful wars and be competitive in Europe. And so they're conflicting because of that, but also they're not a member of the Anglican Church. And the Church of England and the official national religion of England was the Anglican Church. And they're into their own Protestant group here now, 
as we've talked about before, one of many, uh, who interprets religion and connections with God and Christ and so on and so forth differently. And so these are all reasons why the king has a problem with them. And they're also unique in that, you know, this concept of everyone is equal really transforms itself over to and carries over to Native Americans. Uh, he signs a treaty with the Native Americans and purchases the land with them on a basis that was considered to be fair. He didn't believe that Native Americans should have their land take, taken from them. Settlers should pay for it fairly. So therefore, in Penn's Woods, there was generally a pretty good degree of positive relationship and, and positive interaction between Native Americans and the settlers there. The whole concept of pacifism and so on and so forth uh, within the Quaker uh, uh, faith and, and way of thinking uh, transforms itself into a, a, a slogan or a the nickname for the city of Philadelphia for which he helps establish and plan, and that is the city of brotherly love. When they would pass each other on the street, another man would say, good day, brother, and if it was a woman that he was passing, they would say, good day, sister. So this whole concept of pacifism and, and, and everybody being the same really promotes kind of the concept of tolerance and toleration as well. That is a theme in some American colonies. And if you think about it, if we've done our home learning already for lesson two, the chart about Connecticut and Rhode Island and uh, some of those other colonies that break away from the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the intolerant Puritans, there was some toleration there with a guy by the name of Roger Williams. Make sure you've done some of that homework. The population of Pennsylvania also very, very much diverse. Penn advertised throughout Europe, come here, religious freedom, everybody's the same, practice your religion, and so they did. And it's probably one of the most diverse colonies there is because of this. Significant numbers of German settlers and Dutch come there, and these German settlers were very, very good at farming. And the land in Pennsylvania especially was pretty darn good for farming, especially in the southern and western parts of it. And so these German farmers and other farmers as well make it far, very agriculturally prosperous. And as I mentioned with the other colonies, gradually this proprietor, which William Penn also was, he basically drove life there, relieves or releases some of his control over things and people get political liberty on top of the religious liberty they already had. And so the Charter of Liberties, passed in 1701, allowed colonists to elect their representatives to a legislature. We see some themes here now developing over time, right, between the colonies. Despite differences in backgrounds as to why they were settled, there are some common things that are happening here. The Swedes settled southern Pennsylvania. A Charter of Privileges also allowed them to form their own legislature to represent Swedes. And then as they, as time went on, they gradually functioned and operated as a separate colony themselves, known as Delaware, but they kind of operated under Pennsylvania's governor, but they had autonomy and independence there. And so there's a lot of diversity there in Pennsylvania because of that. And so here's our left side. Make sure you're getting some left side work done. Refer back to the notebook or to the, me, the book, the lesson three in the book. There's a chart here that might help you with the economic type of activity going on here, but maybe read through quickly some of those things that are going on in lesson three uh, and chart and bullet detail some of the things going on here in terms of who's settling where, what type of government that is, uh, proprietorship, royal governors, uh, royal colonies, that kind of thing. Uh, the different types of uh, uh, laws that were passed governing the colonies and that kind of thing politically, and then the Quakers and the Puritans. We know a little bit about the Quakers. We know a lot about, about the Puritans. Go back and review the Puritans. Quick chart out similarities and differences. Make yourself a little claim statement there based on one of those stem sentences and you're good to go. Be ready for a little quiz or understanding check. This next class coming up next week and make hay be productive use your time work in groups the remainder of the time you have to get this left side work done good day